Today, we're taking a trip into the past, to a time of corsets, poison, and murder. Mary Blandy was a fair maiden in the 1740s, with her heart set on a bad boy that her father heavily disapproved of. He forbid the two of them from marrying, thinking that his daughter would just move on and find a good man, but she did quite the opposite. She loved her bad boy, and her father standing in the way of this relationship only made her want to get rid of her father. Without him, she and her bad boy could be together, and they would inherit all her father's money too. So happy Valentine's Day. Let's uncover the poison marriage plot from 18th century London. Before we get into this episode, I just want to thank our sponsor for making this video possible, Skillshare. Well, now we're in February, and I've always said that the new year actually starts in February. January is just like a practice run. It doesn't count. So now I'm at the point where I'm thinking, okay, how do I want to enrich my life this year? Maybe you want to learn how to crochet, you want to pick up a new hobby or a skill, or maybe you just want to level up in your career, in your job. And if you don't know where to start with that, Skillshare is your new best friend. It's the biggest online community of learners and if you're looking for a place to improve yourself and your work, Skillshare is the place to be. We've all heard of the standard Skillshare course. It's an online lesson, like a little video that you can follow along with. Well now, Skillshare have what's called learning paths, which are specially curated playlists of different courses in a particular field. And basically all these courses work together to teach you like a full, well-rounded lesson. It's not just one specific course on one specific thing. You can learn how to do a whole, hobby, I guess. The learning path that I've been working through recently is called reconnect to yourself with guided journaling because I have wanted to get into journaling for the longest time, but I just don't know where to start. I don't know what prompts to use. I don't know how to dig up in there. I don't know how to uncover the darkest parts of my brain. Maybe that's a dangerous thing to want to do, but I did it anyway. And this learning path gave me so many different journaling techniques and methods and just different angles to come at it that I'd never even thought about before. Before. For example, the first course in this learning path is all about how to journal with drawing. And let me tell you, it's been really useful to like release and process different emotions from different things that have happened to me throughout the day. If I can like draw that out, it helps me to kind of make peace with it in my mind. There were a bunch of different methods of journaling that I learned through this learning path, like guided meditations, guided journaling. There was even a whole course about like digital journaling, which if you're a, a tech girly, then maybe that one's for you. The lessons are short, they're easy to follow along with, and they're just really satisfying to complete and you feel like you've really done something for yourself to enrich your soul. Skillshare have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of courses, so even if journaling isn't your bag, I'm sure you will find something on there that is. They have everything from techie stuff like photography and 3D modeling and editing to more practical stuff like sewing and cooking. They have social media classes. I've seen so many classes about like becoming a YouTuber if you're interested in that. And Skillshare are very kindly giving the first 500 of you guys that click the link down in the description of this video a month free trial of Skillshare. So don't delay. What if 499 people People have already clicked that link. Go click it now and get started with your learning path. Thank you so, so much to Skillshare again for sponsoring this video. That learning path has been so useful for me. Now, before we get into the case, I just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is publicly available information that myself and my team have gathered and compiled into this video. This video will cover a lot of sensitive topics, so viewer a discretion is advised. I couldn't find any particular things to warn you about. I'm really sorry if I've missed anything, but just in general, <laughs> as a general rule for my channel, we talk about some crazy, mad, scary shit, so be careful. While we make every effort to fact check our sources and make sure that all of our information is correct, no action should be taken in reliance upon the information in this video. All opinions that are about to be stated are mine and mine alone. And with all that being said, 
let's hop in our time travel machine and go back almost 300 years to 1740s England. We haven't done a true crime case this vintage in ages and I'm really, really excited. I even kind of dressed the part. I think I look like I'm from the 1700s, probably not. So the location is Henley-on-Thames, just outside of London in Oxfordshire. This was home to the Blandy family, a very wealthy father, mother and daughter, all living together in this grand, castle mansion thingy. They had a bunch of staff. They were very well-to-do people. The patriarch of this family was Francis Blandy, a man in his 50s. He was a very well-respected lawyer in their area. He was kind of like the best lawyer around. If anyone had any legal troubles, they would go to Francis Blandy. And he was also known outside of his work for just being a very kind man. Everyone loved Francis because he was very generous with his money, with his hospitality. He would allow people to come and stay at their house. He always had his door open. He was always hosting dinner parties. Everyone was always welcome at the Blandy house. And so everyone loved Francis, but he did have a secret motive for wanting to host all these dinner parties and different events. It's because he was desperately trying to find his daughter, his only child, a husband. Her name was Mary Blandy and she was in her late 20s at this point in time, which in those days that was considered knocking on. Back then women were only considered baby making machines and her biological clock was ticking. Her father worried that she wouldn't be desirable to men for much longer. And of course she needed a husband because back then women were hardly even considered their own person. They were always the the belonging of a man. They were always owned either by their father when they were first born and then their father would hand them off to their husband and they would be owned by their husband. So even though like in this day and age, if a father had one child and it was a daughter, she would get his inheritance. But back then, she needed a husband for him to be able to pass the inheritance on to her. She couldn't just have it herself. And of course, Francis was a very, very wealthy man. He had a lot of stuff to pass on to his daughter, his company, his reputation, his money, the house, the staff, everything. She was set to inherit a whole entire life. He was desperate for her to find a good, respectable man, someone that is worthy of all of this inheritance. And so for that exact reason, Francis had set a very high dowry for his daughter. And a dowry was basically a payment that was made from the bride's family to her new husband when they got married. Almost like a thanks for taking her off our hands gift. The bride's family themselves would decide how much to set the dowry at and Mary's was set at 10,000 pounds, which is insane in itself. But remember this was back in the 1740s. So 10,000 pounds back then is the equivalent of 2 million. Today. Francis Blandy was saying, whoever marries my daughter, I will give you two million pounds. Please, just someone marry my daughter. Not gonna lie, I would be so offended by that. Imagine your dad thinking that you can't get a boyfriend that much that he's like offering to pay boys two million just to spend time with you. Oh my God. But to him, it really was that desperate. He was worried that soon Mary would be undateable. And once no one wanted to marry her and have a child with her, then where the fuck would all the inheritance go? Like, what would they actually do with that? He was so desperate for her to find someone that Francis began taking his daughter to a bunch of different balls. They even spent a season in Bath, which was quite a popular place for like, I don't know, singles balls. What would they call them back then? Surely it wasn't like singles events. But you know those things, you seen them in Bridgerton where they would take their daughters to and like dress them all up in jewels and lovely gowns and then have them like go out and start dancing with some fellas, get to know them. It's kind of giving Cinderella, you know, when they would go to the ball and they were all trying to get the prince and you know, they'd all dress up. Like it was kind of like putting yourself on show every night, like a little advert for yourself. Like, hey boys, you could marry this, hey? And that is how most marriages actually started back then was just, you would spot her across the room and go and ask her to dance and then, the rest is history. And it was through one of these balls in Bath that Mary had a rather short-lived courtship, but it was still something. He was an army captain and it was said that he at once stepped into the breach and gallantly laid siege to her fair fortress. Whatever that means. It sounds dirty though, that's crazy. <laughs> but like I said, this courtship was very short-lived. The army captain got called back out to the army and with that, 
Mary was all on her own again. Her father was growing increasingly worried because time was going by and like th all the short lived things that she did have were never working out. And at this point he was starting to think, well, is there something wrong with my daughter? What is she doing to drive these men away? But then Mary Blandy seemed to find romance in the most unexpected place. All these years, she'd been showing up and showing out at these balls, trying to get a man. She'd been putting on all these gowns, all these jewels, really putting in the effort. And then on one night, they go around to a family friend's house. They, they were putting on a dinner. They'd invited the Blandy family round. And it was this one night when she wasn't even trying that she found the love of her life. These family friends that they were visiting actually had their nephew down to stay with them from Scotland. And he was an army captain, Captain William Henry Cranston. He went by Henry most of the time and he was from a very well-to-do family. Of course, this family friend was minted, proper, proper rich. And Henry was in the army. He was around Mary's age. He was a catch. He was perfect. Well, to be fair, all of that was perfect, but the history books have not been very kind about Henry's appearance. <laughs> they say that he was spotty and freckled. He had weak eyes, clumsy legs. Not the most elegant gentleman at the ball. But Mary Blandy wouldn't be the first woman to risk it all for an ugly man, would she? We've all been there. Anyway, Mary and Captain Henry get talking and the two of them really hit it off. And Mary's family are over the moon. They'd been waiting for this day <laughs> for all their lives. Ever since Mary was born, they wanted her to find a good man and it finally seemed like it was happening. Mary's family were just over the moon with this pairing. They thought he was a great guy. Of course, he was from a great family. And so they didn't waste any time like trying to get him into the family. So they invited him to come and stay at their big massive house in Henley. So he came and he lived with Mary and her family for a few months and the pair were spotted a few times going on romantic walks, holding hands around the lake. It was rather scandalous. Mary's mother adored Henry and her father liked him too. He treated him like the son that he never had. Like, sure, he might not be devilishly handsome, but he's a catch in other ways and he seemed good for their daughter. Mary Blandy was finally set for her happily ever after. Or so they thought. A few months into this relationship, Mary's father received a letter one day. It was from the same family friend who they'd met Henry through. It was his uncle. And he was actually writing to let the Blandy family know that Henry is not who they thought he was. It turned out Mary's lover was harboring a huge secret that he was married. Not only that, married with a kid. He had a whole family back up north in Scotland, but he'd been living with her in Henley. He'd just abandoned his wife and kid. But he was able to keep this marriage very hush-hush. Not a lot of people actually knew that he was married because his wife, was on the enemy's side and he was in the army. Like it, it that never would have worked if people knew about that. It's kind of crazy. I love that drama of like a forbidden romance. So they got like secretly married. They had this kid and they were trying to keep it a secret from like everyone in Scotland. I don't know how that was going, but they were trying. They even had the daughter. How do you keep a child secret from the world? And she was actually born in the week of Valentine's Day in 1745. Oh, very festive. And it was when that daughter was 18 months old, a year and a half, that Henry went down to Henley for the first time, left them in Scotland, and that was where he began his affair with Mary. He found it very easy to be unfaithful because he had to keep his marriage a secret anyway. And it wasn't unusual that he would spend long periods of time away from the house so to not blow their cover. So when he started spending so much time in Henley, I wonder if his wife even thought twice about it, but whatever, he was able to live this double life and no one was questioning it too much. To be fair though, as I was writing this case, I was I was thinking, I bet it was so easy to get away with like criminal shit, it, like infidelity, all that kind of stuff. Any kind of secrets in the 1700s. There's no social media, there weren't even postmen. Were there postmen? No. Were there postmen in the 1700s? Just had a brain fart and Googled, when were postmen invented? <laughs> anyway, I'm just kind of thinking of this from Mary's point of view, and I'm thinking it probably would make a lot of sense for him to be going back up to Scotland 
often because he still has family up there his mum lives up there and whatever and his mum was very sick so if I was Mary I wouldn't think twice about him going up to Scotland all the time but he was probably going back up to fucking see his wife and kids he was juggling them both at the same time but yeah absolute bombshell dropped on the Blandy family with this letter and so they decide to go and confront Henry about this double life and he actually admitted that yes there was a wedding but he didn't actually think that the marriage contract itself, what made it legally binding, he didn't think that was legal. He believed that his marriage was null and void and he would be able to get an annulment, but he just hadn't gotten around to it yet. So he was saying to the Blandy family, like, yes, I did have a wedding to another woman, but we're not like actively still married. I'm gonna get it sorted with the Scottish courts and then it'll be annulled and I'll be able to marry your daughter. And they believed him. Well, Mary believed him. And I think Mary's mother believed him. And I don't know if Francis believed him, but either way, he was fucking fuming with Henry Cranston. He felt that he had been made a fool of by this rogue, this man that had come and taken advantage of his hospitality, taken advantage of his daughter. He really didn't like Henry after what he had done. He no longer thought that he was a suitable man for his daughter. But Mary didn't seem to actually care all that much. I was quite surprised by that. Well, I guess in the 1700s, women couldn't argue things and be mad about things, really, could they? Because, I don't know, we weren't even fucking seen as human beings, never mind people with feelings that are valid. Back in those days, women just had to be quiet and compliant, so I guess Mary was. Yeah, she never really, like, kicked up a fuss about the fact that he had a wife and a kid. She just... She still wanted to be with him. In her eyes, the marriage could still go on. Everything was fine. She didn't really gaff Mary Blandy's id gaff era. To be fair to Mary though, she was the second woman. She was the other woman. Like you would be more pissed off if you were the first one and then he cheated on you, but she was the second one. And in her mind, she's like, well, he wants to be with me. He's, he's run away from her to be with me. She didn't have anything to worry about really, so. As far as she was concerned, nothing really changed. Other than the fact that there should have been a huge blaring red flag. This is more than just a red flag. This is like a giant fucking neon sign with a giant arrow being like, don't trust this man. That was an arrow, by the way. I was giving more dolphin. But at the same time, think about how long Mary Blandy had waited for a man to want her. Like, I don't know. At this point, I guess she is forgiving a load of shit that she probably shouldn't forgive because she don't want to lose him now that she's finally got him. Francis desperately wanted Mary to cut Henry off and to just move on and find someone new. She could find a good man, but Mary didn't want to hear it. She insisted to her father that Henry was the one for her and that he would never do anything like that to her. To be fair, there's not really much that he could do to fight this. He could tell that Mary was still gonna stay with Henry no matter what. And so with that, her father reluctantly let them stay together. At this point, Henry was away working with the army a lot, but do we know that he was even doing that? He might have been back up in Scotland with his wife and his kid, as if nothing had ever happened, as if he didn't have a woman on the side down in Henley. But whenever he was in town in Henley, he would live a life of luxury with Mary Blandy. He would be wined and dined. He could stay in their grand castle. He lived there rent free. He was always enjoying their luxury life. They had staff that waited on them hand and foot. He had the perfect life. Whenever he was in Henley, he had all of that for free. Much to Francis Blandy's dismay. He never forgave Henry. And as much as he let his daughter stay with him, Francis always side-eyed Henry and he was always hawk-eyed looking for him to mess up again. They would regularly still get into arguments, him saying that she should leave Henry and she should find someone else, but Mary never wanted her. And her mother even started taking her side in this. She would tell her husband, leave her alone, just stop it. She's happy with Henry, let her stay with him. In fact, Mary's mother is barely mentioned in the reports on this case, but she had a very crucial part to play in what came next. At some point that year, she fell terribly ill. And of course, at that point in the 1700s, illnesses were very misunderstood. The chances of recovering from something that had you bedridden back in those days were practically impossible. People died of fucking all sorts, didn't they? Things were not looking good for Mary's mother. They didn't really know what she had, but it was thought that she wouldn't survive much longer. And as she laid there suffering and in pain, 
Mary reported that her mother yelled, send for Henry. Basically meaning, locate Henry and bring him to me at once. They were a very rich family. They could, they could quite literally just do that. At this point in time, Henry was actually out serving in the army. Uh, like to be fair to him, he was actually doing his job. And when he heard the news of Mary's mother, he left his post and went straight to the Blandy house in Henley. But once he arrived, Mary's mother miraculously got better, which I don't know if that was a coincidence or if she was never even ill in the first place. Perhaps it was a manipulation tactic just to get Henry down to the house, but regardless, he was there now and he would spend another month with them. Mary's mother and Mary, of course, were delighted to see Henry. They couldn't wait to have him back every time he left, but her father, on the other hand, wanted to get him gone as soon as possible. Six months after this whole incident, you know, of her being very sick and then having that miraculous recovery, six months later, she did die. She did just drop dead of some sort of illness. So maybe she was ill at the time and maybe it got a bit better, but then came back. I don't know, I really don't know. That's one thing I've really struggled with, with this case, with it being so freaking old. I have so many questions and I try to Google them and the internet's like, I don't know, that's well old, I don't know. If only Steve Jobs had been born in the 1700s, then I might have, more on this case. But anyway, back to Mary's mother dying because she was very ill and they knew that she was dying. She was like bedridden. And actually, as she lay on her deathbed, she turned to her husband and said her final words. Mary has set her heart on Henry. When I'm gone, let no one set to you against the match. She was basically telling her husband, stay away from our daughter's relationship. She is happy with this man. And I know that when I'm dead, you're gonna try and get in the middle of it. You're gonna try and ruin it, but don't. Let her be happy. When her mum passed away, Mary called once again for Henry to come to the house, but he didn't come right away. He told Mary that he was actually in hiding at this point in time. What? <laughs> Where's that come from? He told her that he was in a lot of debt. And I don't know if he ever actually told her like why, how he'd landed himself in that much debt, but he said he was in a severe amount of debt and the debt collectors were after him. And so he had to be in hiding, otherwise his life would be over. Mary took pity on him and of course she wanted to get him back. So she said, okay, let me just pay these debts. She sent him what the equivalent of 3000 pounds would be today. And this was the first of many times that Henry would use Mary Blandy for her money, which is just another red flag, just another, red flag to throw on top of the pile of never ending red flags that this man has. He should be the CEO of Red Flag and Co. But then just when you think it can't get much worse than this, it does. On one of their romantic walks around the park, Henry drops another bombshell that he had not just one child, he had another one by another woman. He had two kids that he wasn't caring for. But again, Mary took it quite well. Like I said before, as if she had much of a choice, women had to be quiet and, you know, just do whatever their husbands wanted back then. So yeah, she didn't kick up a fuss. And I guess when you already know about one abandoned child and wife, what's another illegitimate child to add to the mix? Like, I guess it didn't make much of a difference to her at that point in time. But men like Henry, once you forgive them once, they'll play you for a fool forever. And that's exactly what he did to Mary. One day she was cleaning their room when she came across a flirty letter in his jacket pocket and it was addressed to a gallant captain. Who the fuck was calling her man a gallant captain? <laughs> Girls dare call my boyfriend a gallant captain, I'm throwing fists. But with the addition of this letter, that means that Henry Cranston is now juggling four different women, including Mary. And two of them he has had children with. And he doesn't even fucking see the kids. Well, as far as we know, he might actually, but we don't know. They should have invented like air tags back then and she could have just put one on him and seen where he, where he was going when he wasn't in Henley. But you know what? Mary didn't take this letter very well. She had taken the last two bombshells rather well, but this one, she wasn't feeling the same way. And I guess this one is different, isn't it? The other two bombshells were that he had done something crazy in the past. He had a child, he had a wife that he'd abandoned in the past, but their present was fine, wasn't it? So I can see why she could move on from those things, but this letter, is also in the present. He is presently seeing another woman 
and Mary. So this time she was not as easy to forgive. In fact, she told him that she didn't want to see him anymore. Did she mean that? I don't know. Was she going to go back on that word? Maybe. She is just a girl after all. She's just like me. But at first she, you know, she was standing up for herself and she was saying, no, how can you do this to me? And all this kind of stuff. And he was groveling. He was begging for her back. He got down on his knees. He was like grabbing at her petticoats, like crying, like, no, please, you have to take me back. And she fucking did, didn't she? She did. But I think what did it for her was Henry was quite a manipulative man. And he reminded her of her mother's dying wish that the two of them stay together and they stay happy. He was saying to Mary, she wouldn't want to upset her mother, would she? This is what her mother had wanted. So yeah, eventually Mary forgave him. Everything's back on. But Francis Blandy absolutely despised Henry now. I mean, he never really liked him, had he? But now it was worse than ever. I fear that this was the point of no return. And by this point, he was also just very suspicious of Henry's intentions with his daughter because he'd been saying this whole time, of course, they'd all found out about this marriage that he insisted wasn't legally binding and that he was gonna get it annulled so then why hadn't he? Why was it taking him so long? That was an all right excuse at first, but yeah, now Francis was being like, well, come on, when are you gonna get the marriage annulled? When are you gonna marry my daughter? It seemed that Henry was stalling. Maybe he never actually intended on getting his marriage annulled. Maybe he never actually intended on marrying Mary Blandy. It was becoming very clear to Francis especially, but I mean to everyone else other than Mary, that Henry was just using her for her money and for her status and her house and the staff and everything that the money could give him. But he didn't really care that much about the woman. She had helped him out of debt so many times, lent him money, she would give him a place to stay, food to eat when he was in town, and he was just taking advantage of her generosity. Henry could tell at this point that the relationship that he had with Mary's father, Francis, was on the ropes. I mean, it, like I say, it had never been good, but now he felt like if he made one wrong move, Francis could kick him out of the house and he could forbid him from ever seeing his daughter again. So he knew he needed to do something to ease the tensions. He needed to make peace with Francis Blandy somehow. So one day he mentioned to Mary that back up north where he's from in Scotland, there was this witchy lady that used to make love potions and she would sell them and people would take them or like administer them to other people and it would cause love. <laughs> yes, in a romantic sense, someone could take it and then like fall head over heels in love with their boyfriend or whatever. I mean, you would kind of actually hope you were already in love with your boyfriend, that was a bad example. But in smaller doses, these love potions could just make someone grow a fondness for another person, you know? Didn't necessarily have to be like romantic love. And so he suggested that maybe they should try and get a hold of some of this love potion and slip a little bit to Francis and hope that he warned to Henry and then eventually he might approve of their marriage, forgive his betrayals and let the two of them be together. But Mary wasn't quite on board at first. In fact, she laughed at the very suggestion of a love potion. She didn't believe that that kind of thing even existed. But Henry insisted that it worked. He'd seen it firsthand. In fact, he had had a love potion used on him and it had worked. He said that he had this mortal enemy back up in Scotland and one time someone had slipped him a bit of this love potion in his drink and he ended up forgiving that enemy that he swore he would never forgive. He told Mary to just let them try it. There'd be no harm in trying to slip a little love potion in his tea and see if it worked. They had a lot to gain and not a lot to lose, really. He insisted that there'd be no harm in it and so Mary let him. One night he slipped a little bit of something into Francis's tea. We never actually find out what this love potion is, I will tell you that. But he slipped a little something in his tea and you know what? <laughs> it actually seemed to work. I mean, it wasn't a miracle worker. It wasn't like he suddenly loved Henry and he was like racing for them to get married now, but he did kind of warm to him. For the first time in a long time that night, he sat and had a conversation with Henry. He, I don't know, he was just quite open to spending time with him which is more than he had done in a while, so it was working. If Mary was skeptical about this love potion before, she definitely wasn't now. Now that she'd seen it firsthand, she had seen her father warming to this man that he hated. 
It clearly worked. By now, it was November 1750. Mary and Henry had known each other for about four years at this point, and all in all, he had lived in her house for about a year. Mary paid for absolutely everything for both of them during that whole four years. Like, all of his expenses, all of his debts, all of his travel, money and stuff. Like at this point in November 1750, he told Mary that his mother was gravely ill back up in Scotland and he needed to go and see her and possibly even say his final goodbyes, but he just couldn't afford it. He just couldn't afford to get up to Scotland. Whatever would he do? Of course, Mary paid for him to go up to Scotland and who knows if his mother was even sick. Like what if he was going up there just to see his wife? crazy. So Mary gave Henry the money to go back up to Scotland and visit his dying mother. Little did she know that was actually the last time she would ever see her beloved Captain Henry. Once he had left their grounds, Mary's father turned to her and said, he is never coming back. I forbid the two of you from marrying. I forbid the two of you from ever even contacting each other ever again. She was supposed to go cold turkey without the love of her life. She wasn't even allowed to write him a letter. Yeah, right. Like that was going to happen. Happen. Come on, this is Mary and Henry we're talking about. They are conniving little monkeys. So they found a way to swerve Mary's father's rules and they were writing secret letters to each other, sending secret packages to each other. They discussed that whole love potion plan again and they both agreed that they would like to keep trying with it because it had worked a little bit last time. The effects of it hadn't lasted very long but it seemed to be working. They did theorise that they might have to keep upping the dose or keep dosing him more often to let it build up in his body because obviously the effects of it weren't very strong or very long lasting last time so if they upped the dose and upped the frequency of the doses maybe that'd be enough. So with that Henry sends Mary a package from Scotland with some love pebbles which were literally just pebbles from the floor. Like I don't really get that part of it, but along with the love pebbles was some love powder, which was what she was supposed to put into her father's tea and it was gonna hopefully work. He instructed Mary to put a pinch of this powder in each cup of tea that her father drank and he drank multiple cups of tea a day. So they were hoping that it would all just build up inside his system. And they hoped that if enough of it built up inside of him, then he would eventually accept Henry. At least that's what Henry said it would do. But it never actually occurred to Mary that her beloved Henry had seldom been an honest man in the time that she'd known him. This is a man that had played and cheated multiple women, abandoned them and his children, yet Mary Blandy thought that she could trust him. She thought that he would be different for her. She never actually stopped to think for a minute throughout this whole process that Henry might actually be against her. Or maybe he just didn't have the purest of intentions, but she didn't even think of that. She just thought that her boyfriend was on her side. As Mary began to administer this powder into her father's tea, he grew very sick. It got to the point where he was totally bedridden, in fact. He was violently vomiting and doing something else from somewhere else as well that I'm not going to say, that's gross. But he wasn't the only member of the household to fall sick around that same time. A couple of the housemaids were also ill with the same symptoms. At the time, everyone just kind of assumed it was some sort of flu or contagious illness that was clearly passing around the house. No one suspected foul play. No one, no one suspected anything really. No one had put two and two together at this point that the first housemaid that fell ill, her name was Susan. She was like Francis Blandy's right hand woman. She was like the main housemaid. And she was often the one that would clear up his empty teacups. Now, on the odd occasion that the teacup wasn't completely empty, Susan would finish it off herself. She had also drank from the same teacup that Francis Blandy had, and now they were both ill, but no one had kind of put that together yet. Susan was ill for about a week, but she recovered and then came back to work as, as you would with any illness. So no one really thought too much of it. But right when Susan came back to work, another one of the housemaids was taken ill 
with that exact same illness, it seemed. All the same symptoms. And again, no one realised at this point, but she had done the exact same thing that Susan had done. Because Susan wasn't there to clear up Francis's teacups, this housemaid was, and she had also finished one of them off. No one was noticing the connections here, so it did seem like just a very random contagious illness that had taken over the house. And because of this, because there were multiple people in the house that were all ill at once, people have questioned for centuries just how much Mary Blandy knew about what she was putting in the tea. Did she know that she was making everyone ill? Or did she genuinely think she was putting a love potion in there but everyone happened to be getting ill by some separate illness. Had she herself not put two and two together? We don't know if Henry specifically told her like exactly what the powder was, what he'd sent her and what its effects were gonna be. We don't know how much she actually knew about this whole plan or whether she was being directed by Henry and it was his like master plan. This is one thing we'll talk a little bit more about at the end of this case. Like was she just the middleman in Henry's evil plan or was she very aware of what she was doing? Was she intentionally poisoning her father to be with her bad boy? But whatever she thought this love potion was, it clearly wasn't working. Her father was just sick in bed. He wasn't talking about Henry. He wasn't thinking about Henry. He was still no closer to approving of their relationship. So Mary wrote to Henry and she basically told him the situation, like the love potion doesn't seem to be working. And he sent her a rather weird message back. First, he said that his mother was preparing a flat for Mary in Scotland. Why? <laughs> but also something else weird about that is that wasn't your mum on her deathbed a few months ago? What do you mean? And now she's like preparing a whole entire flat for Mary. And also why? Like I just, strange. He then went on to answer Mary's qualms about the love powder, that it wasn't working. And so he said that they should up the dose, but in order to up the dose, you need to put it in something more substantial than tea. Otherwise the, he would taste it and it'd be gross and he wouldn't want to ingest it. So the night Mary received this letter, she went into the kitchen and told the cooks to prepare a pot of gruel, which if you don't know what gruel is, uh, neither do I really. It's kind of like a, a watery oat soup smoothie, milky oat, mush. Yum. Famously, Oliver Twist loves a bit of it, but <laughs> it looks gross. Anyway, the next morning, the housemaids enter the kitchen and they see Mary standing over the top of that pot of gruel. When she spotted the housemaids had walked in, she seemed quite flustered and she said that she'd just been tasting it and she said that she'd actually grown a great fancy to it. But later that day, when the gruel was served to her father, once again, he was violently ill. Everything was coming out of him from both ends. Ugh. No, it's actually not funny. Like imagine that being documented in the history books that you shat yourself. And then some girl 300 years later is like telling it to a million people on the internet. You don't even know what the internet is. All you know is that loads of people now know that you've shat yourself. Well, I mean, he's dead. He doesn't know any of this, but it's just mad. Please don't ever write anything like that about me in the history books. Please just say that I was pretty and kind. But anyway, Francis was so, so sick at this point in time that he couldn't keep anything down. He was just vomiting everything back up. So he hadn't eaten in a long time and everyone was a bit worried. He was very frail and weak. And so Mary suggested, why don't we give him another bowl of gruel? After all, it was just water and oats. It's supposed to be quite easy on the stomach, but you guessed it. As soon as he had that other bowl of gruel, it made him 10 times worse. The next morning when he woke up, his symptoms persisted and he still couldn't eat. In fact, he never even finished that second bowl of gruel from the night before. So, Susan the housemaid, in classic Susan the housemaid behavior, she took this bowl of gruel and finished it on the way down. Oh, she done it again. So of course, Susan is taken horrifically ill. In fact, she was so much worse this time around because obviously they've upped the dose. It was in the gruel now. She'd eaten so much more than she had drank before with the tea. And Susan was older than Francis as well. So it was hitting her so much harder. Whatever was in that gruel, was really doing a number on her. She genuinely nearly died. Like she was bedridden for weeks and weeks and weeks. And by now, finally, some people in the Blandy household were growing suspicious of this whole sudden like contagious illness malarkey. In fact, one of the housemaids had actually spotted this pattern that it does seem to be whenever one of them 
shares their master's food or drink that they would also fall ill just like him. They'd finally cottoned on and one of them very bravely offered to be a test subject. So they went over to that pot of gruel that they all believe is poisoned now and this woman ate a bowl of it just to be a guinea pig to see if she fell ill. And what do you know? Of course she did. She was severely ill. So now the staff knew there must be something wrong with the food that they're cooking and they couldn't quite tell where it was coming from. So they called an apothecary to come down to the house, which is kind of like the old timey version of like a chemist or a pharmacist. He took a sample of this gruel for testing and five days later, they finally had some answers. The apothecary confirmed what they had all feared that someone had intentionally poisoned the food. And with that, everyone suspected Mary. So the apothecary suggested that they should try to look through Mary's letters with Henry and they could see what they were talking about, see if they were plotting to specifically poison the food in the house. But her father, Francis, was very against that. He adored his daughter. His daughter was his pride and joy and he never wanted to upset her. And he knew that invading her privacy and reading her letters would be a huge betrayal to her. She would never forgive him. So even though he did suspect his own daughter of poisoning him and this would be how they could find proof, he still wasn't willing to do it. He didn't want to upset his daughter, even after all this. Instead, he decided that he was just gonna confront Mary face to face. Well, actually, he, he was kind of a passive aggressive king about this, not gonna lie. The next day, when they all sat around the breakfast table, Francis Blandy had his tea as usual, and he very bravely took a drink of it, knowing that it was probably poison, but this was all part of the plan. He then remarked to Mary that his tea had a gritty taste this morning. She wouldn't know anything about that, would she? Well, in that moment, Mary realized that her father was onto her. She panicked, jumped up from the kitchen table and fled, <laughs> like just ran out of the room into the kitchen. He followed her in. He wasn't gonna let her get away from him. And he very calmly told her a tale from his youth. He said that one night he and all of his friends had been out at a winery drinking a bottle of wine. And the next day, all three of them were horrifically ill. Of the three of them that were drinking that night, Francis Blandy was the only one of them to survive that bottle of wine. It killed the other two men. The first one on the day after they drank it and the other one died a few days later. Francis was the only survivor. He looked Mary dead in the eyes and said, I have survived them both and it is my fortune to be poisoned at last. It turns out that the wine that Francis and his friends had drank that night was poisoned with arsenic. Not intentionally, um, arsenic was often in pesticides that were used at the vineyards to like, vineyards? Vin vine? At the, it was used on the grapes. <laughs> they would spray these pesticides on the grapes, the grapes would be poisoned, and then they would be squashed into this wine. So the wine was poisoned literally right from the chuffing berry. Arsenic has had a lot of different uses over the centuries. Most of them are not still in practice because of how dangerous arsenic actually is. It's been used in the past as a dye, either for paints or sometimes in makeup. In the Victorian era, women would wear arsenic on their faces. It's actually horrifying to think that they were in the trenches so bad that they used to use arsenic on their faces, radium on like their nails and their teeth to make them whiter. What the hell was going on girls? But the most notorious use for arsenic is as a straight up poison. Um, for pesticides, of course, in the, in the vineyards, uh, it's often used as a rat poison. And of course, if you are a true crime fan, you might know that arsenic is used as a people poison <laughs> sometimes. Not legally, never legally, but sometimes people die from arsenic poisoning. Up until the 1830s, which is after this case, Arsenic was almost completely undetectable. It had no taste, it had no smell, and one form of it actually looked incredibly like sugar. Perfect if you want to poison your father's tea, perhaps? Francis Blandy had finally connected all of the dots. He knew how it felt to be poisoned with something. He'd gone through that once before, and he was identifying that that's definitely what was happening here. His daughter was now the one doing this to him. He'd now connected in his head that yes, it was his daughter that was making him tea lately. It was his daughter that suggested he should have some gruel to help his stomach. And then when that didn't work and he didn't eat all day, she suggested it again. She was trying to kill him. So when her father came in and told her this rather cryptic 
story. I mean, they both knew what he was hinting at. They both knew that he was saying, I know you've poisoned me, bitch. She thought if she could get rid of all of the evidence, AKA her letters between her and Henry, then no one would actually be able to say for sure that she was poisoning her father's tea. People might suspect her still, but they wouldn't have any proof. So she ran up to her bedroom and she grabbed everything, all her letters to and from Henry, the love pebbles, any of the powder that she had left, anything that could be considered evidence. She rushed back downstairs and tossed it all on the fire. When Mary eventually left the room, the servants grappled with the fire to try to retrieve anything of use, but all they managed to grab were two of the very many things that had actually burned. They managed to salvage part of a letter from Henry where he's talking about a love powder, although this letter itself wasn't all that incriminating, so it was a bit frustrating. But the other thing that they managed to grab was very incriminating, a sample of the powder itself. They hoped that this powder might be of use in case there was an investigation. Well, there definitely was gonna be an investigation now, but they feared it might be a murder investigation because things weren't looking good for Francis Blandy. He'd only gotten sicker and sicker as the days had been going by. And later that evening, they called for a doctor who officially diagnosed a poisoning. When the doctor left, he actually took with him a sample of the powder that was recovered from the fire. He was gonna test it. And then hopefully then they would have some concrete proof that Mary Blandy was the culprit. The walls were closing in on her. She had nowhere left to run from what she had done. And she was looking guilty about by the hour. But she was about to put her foot in it once again. And this time she would completely ruin everything for herself. She dared to try and get in contact with Henry. She wrote him a letter and she actually gave it to one of her father's staff members to deliver it to, well not to deliver it to Henry, but to post it for her. This letter was addressed to Willie which, uh, which first of all, lol. I mean, of course it was supposed to be a bit of a decoy. They were gonna see the name Willie on there and think, oh, she's definitely not contacting Henry. Is she forgetting that everyone knows that this man's name is Captain William Henry Cranston? She's not the only one that knows his first name. His first name is William and your whole family knows that. As soon as they saw that she was trying to send a letter to a man named Willie, they put two and two together and they were like, hold on a second, that's definitely to Henry. The staff were incredibly suspicious of this letter. And while Mary's father never wanted to open her post, he never wanted to overstep that boundary with her. The staff didn't care. The staff were ripping open that letter and reading it themselves. In this letter, she'd written, my father is so bad that I only have time to tell you. If you don't hear from me soon again, don't be frightened. And lest any accident should happen to your letters, take care what you write. I am ever yours. So this letter was her telling Henry, basically, watch what you're saying in these letters because they're on to us and they might be reading them. And they were. When the servant read this letter, he did not go and post it to Henry. In fact, he took it right up to Francis Blandy's bedroom where he was coughing and vomiting up a storm in there, ew. <laughs> and if Francis Blandy wasn't already filled with poison and on death's door, he might just have died of a broken heart after finding out that his own daughter was behind his deadly sickness. He was quiet as his staff read out the letter to him and by now he was inches from death. He was extremely weak and they knew that he wasn't going to survive much longer. But when they read him the letter out, he simply smiled and said, my poor lovesick girl, what won't she do for a man she loves? Even though he had just been given what looks like definitive proof that his daughter was poisoning him, he was still taking pity on her. He was still forgiving her. He was still seeing the best in her. He summoned her to his chamber and confronted her and Mary just broke down in tears. Francis said that he might be able to find it in his heart to forgive her, but on one condition, that she helps to bring Henry to justice. Because Francis believed that this was all Henry. Henry had gotten into his daughter's head. Henry had controlled his daughter, manipulated his daughter into killing him. He didn't think that Mary had anything to do with this. He saw her as just an innocent, sweet little child of his. He thought it must have been that evil army captain that's cheated on all his wives, abandoned his kids. This is just another one of his evil plans. Francis told Mary that she needed to tell the authorities everything that she knew. She had to tell them everything about Henry. And Mary sobbed as she admitted that, yes, she had been slipping something into his tea 
for quite some time, but she insisted that it was never her intention to kill him. She explained the story that Henry had given her about this love powder and about how they were only trying to get him to approve of their relationship. They only ever wanted him to love them and let them be happy together. Francis was incredibly forgiving of Mary throughout this whole thing. He really did just see her as another victim of Henry's because also at this point in time, she didn't have her husband anymore. So he saw her as another victim. You know, Henry had come in, used her for her money, sent her these poisons to kill her dad and then abandoned her as well. Like he had done his last few wives. Wait, no, he only ever had one wife, but there were multiple women. Mary said that her father's kindness was like a sword through the heart. She felt like she didn't deserve his understanding and his pity after what she'd done to him brought him right to death's door. She vowed to her father that she would never see Henry Cranston ever again, but it was too late. On August 14th, 1751, Francis Blandy succumbed to the poison in his body and died at the age of 62. Mary insisted that she was heartbroken over the loss of her father, even calling herself the most wretched orphan that has ever lived. But there are some contradicting accounts from the Blandy house staff who said that Mary didn't seem upset at all over the death of her father. She was showing very little emotion, very little remorse. She was just carrying on as normal. Some of the staff even claimed that Mary had tried to bribe them asking them to run away with her to Scotland or to London or even across the sea to another country. Of course, all of them said, no, we are not gonna go into hiding with you. Mary always denied ever asking the house staff to do this, but I don't know, they all said it was true and I kind of believe them because after this point, they knew they didn't trust Mary. Well, <laughs> they haven't trusted her for a while at this point in time, but they knew that they couldn't trust her to stay put. They knew that she was a flight risk. She was asking everyone to flee with her. So they needed to make sure that she stayed there. And so with that, Mary Blandy was confined to her chambers. She wasn't allowed any kind of contact with the outside world. She wasn't allowed letters. She wasn't, she wasn't allowed out. But that wasn't even the worst part. <laughs> can we make that even worse? Yes, we can. Turns out, so she's like locked up in a bedroom and her family have put someone to guard her door so that she can't run away. The fella that they put there to guard her door was the parish clerk named Ned. Also turns out, it was Mary's ex. Perfect. Imagine being locked up, accused of murder, and then they just put your ex outside the door. What? <laughs> but Ned, the parish clerk, couldn't stand guard forever. Literally, the next day, <laughs> they were out um, digging Francis's grave on the grounds, and Ned went and joined in. Ned went and helped dig. What, you've not, you, he's not even been guarding her room for over 24 hours. So Mary sees Ned leaving and what does she do? She runs away, she, of course she does. This is Mary Blandy. They should have all expected it. Even, I don't know the last and even I expected that. But it is really funny to me that Ned didn't even last a full day of like guard duty. He just got distracted by playing in the garden. <laughs> not playing, they were digging. But anyway, now Mary Blandy is off on the run. She has no money, no plan. And she was soon to find out that she had no friends either. Remember, her dad was very well known, very well loved and well respected in Henley. And the news of his death had rocked everyone to their core. Everyone was so upset. So naturally, when rumors started to to spread that his own daughter, Mary, had done this to him, the whole town hated her. And then on the day that she was spotted fleeing from her home, she was running down the road, an angry mob formed behind her. They were chasing her down, they were yelling at her, she was running away from them. Eventually, a pub landlady took pity on Mary and let her come in and kept her safe from the mob. This was all a bit dramatic, by the way. They'd only chased her down, chased her? They'd only chased her down the road about five minutes, guys, come on. It's hardly like Mary crossed the moors in nothing but her petticoat. Like, they literally chased her to the local pub. And God knows what the locals that were like in the pub at that time must have been thinking when this like fancy lady bursts through the doors yelling about her father's murder or something. Eventually, a friend of the family convinced Mary to just come home. Everything would be okay, she would come home, but when she did, Psych! Everything was not okay. The authorities were there waiting for her. They got her! They got her! <laughs> there wasn't actually a real police force in Britain at that time. I think it was made about 50 years after this case, so almost. Um, but back then, before the police, if you were in trouble with the law, then like, 
I don't know, someone from the like your local authority would come and deal with you. And you'd know that they were official because they'd have like a big gold mace with your town logo on. So when Mary arrived home and she saw this mace man waiting to take her to jail, she knew that that was the end of her plot and the end of her freedom. She was taken to be held in a cell at Oxford Castle while an autopsy was done on her father's body that revealed just how much damage the poison had done to him. All his muscles and fat felt like liquid underneath his skin. His heart and his lungs had these giant black spots all over them and his bowels and his stomach were completely filled up with blood. And his skin, obviously all of that was going on underneath his skin, but his skin was showing all of that horridness going on inside. It was all discolored. He was like marbled, black, blue, purple, yellow, green, like all the different shades of bruising. Honestly, with everything that that poison had done to his body over the amount of time, it's a miracle that he even survived that long. From the very first time that Mary had slipped that poison into his tea, well, to be fair, the first time it ever happened, it was Henry that put something in his tea. Was that the start of all of this? Had he done the first poisoning? But from that point on, from that very first cup of tea, Francis Blandy's body had been fighting against being eaten from the inside out. It was a truly horrific death, but not to worry because the culprit was caught and locked away in a cold, damp stone cell. Obviously, prison in the 1700s were a far cry from the cells that we have now. Back then it was all damp, there were rats, it was just like bare stone, it was freezing cold. There were diseases, there was excrement and piss everywhere. It was like torture. It was more than just prison, it was like pfft, the pits. But all that being said, Miss Mary Blandy didn't quite get the worst of it because she, lucky for her, she was a rich and fancy lady. And even if you're a criminal, even if you're a murderer, you do still get some privileges. She was allowed to take walks in the garden. She was allowed to drink tea multiple times a day. None of the other ones were allowed that. The other ones were all like, shoved in one fucking cell all together. They were like laying on top of each other, but she's allowed out for tea. But it was while she was holed up in Oxford Castle prison that Mary learned that her father had never actually written a will. I mean, he had wanted to, but he'd become so suddenly and violently ill that he'd just never gotten a chance to actually write out a will and decide where all of his wealth was gonna go. So all of that massive fortune that was supposed to be left to her was actually not really left to anyone in particular. And not only that, but the amount of money that was left was way, way less than Mary had ever expected. It was only about 4,000 pounds. And that completely caught her off guard because if you remember when he was desperate for her to get married, he had put a 10,000 dowry on her. So, did they never actually have that 10,000? I mean, maybe he'd spent it, but why would you? I don't know. 4,000 pounds in the end seems like not a lot at all to say that this man was so, so rich. They couldn't tell if Francis Blandy had just been bluffing that whole time and like making out that he was so much richer than he actually was while he was here. Or maybe the money had gone somewhere. I just, who knows? Who actually knows? Maybe he'd just been trying to like scam potential husbands for his daughter saying, yeah, 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 if you, if you date my daughter, you'll get 10,000. And then when they get married, you're like, oh shit, oh, I don't know, I don't know where the 10,000 is. Not that Mary was gonna see any of that money anyway because she was in prison for murder. It baffles me every time I hear about a case like this and they still happen to this day. I mean, the Victoria Cilia's case that we covered not too long ago, her husband was trying to kill her partly for the life insurance money, but how dumb do you have to be? Because chances are you're getting caught for a murder. Definitely, you're getting caught for a murder in the 2020s. Like there's, we have too much technology, the police are too advanced. It's, it would be very, very difficult to actually get away with a murder. And then once they catch you, you don't even get that life insurance money. I always find it so ridiculous that you've gone through all of that and ruined your life, got a murder charge, you're in prison forever. You don't even get to see that money that you wanted. It's so dumb. Mary Blandy's trial was the first one ever recorded where the charge was officially documented as a poisoning. The prosecution called on pretty much everyone involved in this case to stand witness, including servant Susan. Do you remember the lady that liked to finish off her master's cup of teas? I bet she never does that anymore. 
well, I bet she's dead, but I bet she didn't do that anymore for the rest of her life. Susan got up there in court and literally showed them how much weight she had lost from being so ill from drinking her master's tea. She had been poisoned along with him. She'd spent months violently ill with all the same symptoms as Francis. She could have almost lost her life just as collateral damage. Another witness actually told the court that he had heard Mary and Henry chatting shit about her dad. It seemed that they'd been plotting against him for quite some time. In fact, one of them heard Mary call him a toothless old dog, a rascal, and she said that she wished him hell. Insults back in that day were too funny. There is no way you could call me a toothless old dog and I'm not gonna laugh in your face. But the cook had heard something even more incriminating from Mary. She had once said directly to Henry, who wouldn't send an old father to hell for 10,000 pounds? Literally admitting that she would be willing to kill her own father for the family fortune. But Mary's defense vehemently denied that she ever had any ill will towards her father. They insisted that she didn't actually know what was in that powder when she was putting it in his drink. She genuinely thought, it was a, a magic witchy love powder. She said that her intentions were always good with this. She had seen it work a little bit once. And so when she was continually putting it in his tea and then putting even more in his gruel, she insisted that she was just trying to chase the effects of that first time she'd seen it work. But it's not working and it's making him die. So at what point do you stop? I don't know, I personally find it very hard to believe that she didn't realize that she was poisoning him. Like, how are you not, what's not clicking? I think she can deny it all she wants, but her burning all of those letters, literally trying to get rid of evidence, is evidence enough for me, you know? She knew that there was something in those letters that she didn't want people to see. Was it them planning it? Was it them talking about it? Was it them discussing the effects of the love powder Probably, I'm gonna say probably. I really struggle to believe this whole, Mary was just easily manipulated and Henry was the evil mastermind behind it all and she was just innocent and vulnerable. I don't believe it, I don't believe it. I think she also probably wanted a bit of that family fortune of hers. Well, I mean, she was gonna get it either way, but she wanted it with Henry and her father wasn't gonna let her have it with Henry, so. I think she wanted to kill her own dad too. Both of them, both Mary and Henry, had reason to want to get rid of Francis ASAP. So eventually, after a 13 hour deliberation, the jury had a decision. Mary Blandy was found guilty of the murder of her father and she was to be sentenced to death by hanging. She would never see a single penny of that inheritance that she had supposedly dreamed of. In fact, she would never even see another day. Six months after Francis Blandy's death, hundreds of townspeople gathered around the gallows to watch Mary's execution. Back then, a hanging in the town was like free entertainment. People would take their families down. It would be a right day out. Especially because by now, Mary Blandy was a household name and everyone hated her for what she had done to their beloved Francis. So this was kind of like the, the hanging of the century. You know, you know when people say it's like the trial of the century? This was like OJ. This was like everyone watching OJ on telly. Everyone going down to Mary Blandy's execution. The huge crowd was quiet as Mary climbed the ladder and her last words were a simple request to the hangman. She said, gentlemen, do not hang me high for the sake of decency. Even at the very end of her life, she was still that, that prim and proper lady that she'd always been. Remember, modesty was so, so important in the 1700s. Even showing a bit of cheeky ankle would be, I don't know, you'd be looked down upon for that. So even in death, she was determined to keep her dignity. She didn't want stringing too high. She didn't want people looking under her petticoat. After giving her own signal to the hangman, Mary was dropped from the gallows and seconds later, she died. Meanwhile, where the hell is that rogue, Captain William Henry Cranston? By the time Mary was in prison, Henry was already far, far away. He had fled to France. He knew it was only a matter of time until they were looking for him. Now that they'd caught Mary, they were gonna connect it all, and he knew that he wasn't safe in England anymore. So yes, he went over to France, and in true Henry fashion, someone else paid for all of it. 
I don't know who. Maybe another woman. Probably another woman. But someone else paid for the whole thing. He was there in France on a fake name and he was having a grand old time for a couple of months actually. But after a while, Henry's debts were piling up against him and he was also becoming very physically sick. Then in December of that year, just eight months after Mary's hanging, Henry Cranston also passed away hundreds of miles away from home. Within a year of them both committing murder, of them both taking the life of Francis Blandy, both Mary and Henry had lost theirs too. And Francis Blandy was probably watching from a special spot in heaven singing Karma by Taylor Swift. It's just crazy to me how many victims there were in this story. Not necessarily like murder victims, but just victims of Henry specifically. He had ruined so many lives. He had so many, well, he had one wife, he had multiple women, he had children that he'd abandoned. And then think about all the staff at the Blandy house that were collateral damage. They were drinking the poison tea eating the poisoned gruel. Some of them were so ill that they were bed bound, they struggled to recover for months. A lot of them thought that they were gonna die. And some people have even suggested that Mary's mother might have been her very first victim. If you remember, she died quite early on in the story. And like I said, there's not much documentation about her in general. That's why this is speculated these days, because I, d I guess women just weren't very well documented back then, unless they did something mad like this. But that is quite a common theory with this case is that maybe Mary and Henry tried to kill both of her parents because then they would have the whole inheritance then and there. They wouldn't have to wait for the other one to die. And plus, there'd be no one left to object to their marriage. It was a win-win. They got the money, they got to be together. And that's all they wanted. But to be honest, still to this day, people can't agree on how much Mary knew about that poison plan. It goes back to what I was saying earlier. Was she in on it? Had her and Henry discussed what this poison actually was and what it was definitely gonna do to her father? that it was gonna kill him, or it was gonna at least make him very, very sick. Did Mary know that? Or was she just blindly following the love of her life who was sending her letters saying, hey, this is a miracle powder, put it in your dad's tea and we can be together. Was she just that dumb that she went along with it? What if Henry Cranston was some sort of serial con man. Maybe he lied to her about this love potion. All he wanted to do was kill her parents and get the inheritance. But me personally, I don't believe that. <laughs> I think Mary had a little bit of evil in her herself. I mean, just think about her burning all of those letters. For me, that is proof enough in itself that she knew that she had done something wrong. But I wanna know what you guys think on that one. Let me know, do you think she was another victim of Henry's? Cause I think that could be possible. As much as I don't, think it's my top theory. I definitely see why people think that. He does seem to have a pattern of using and abusing people throughout his life, so maybe. Today, the Blandy House is the site of a much more modern horror, a dentist's office. <laughs> Mary Blandy herself was buried between her parents on their old grounds, and actually now, a church has been built over the top of their graves, so if you're ever in a church in Henley, you might just be standing on Mary. But that is all I have for this Valentine's Day kiss. Thank you very much for watching and happy Valentine's Day. You are my Valentine. Say it back, please. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, please leave a thumbs up or leave us a comment down below, absolutely anything. If you engage with this video in some kind of way, it tells YouTube that you enjoyed it and they'll push the video out further. And then me and all my team have really big, super big smiles and we would be so happy and grateful. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Remember the first 500 of you guys to go and click the link down below in the description of this video will get a one month free trial. And it's so, so worth it. I've used Skillshare for years and especially now that they have the learning paths, go for it girl. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you wanna watch another one of my videos, there's one on screen right now, or you can click the circle with my face in it to subscribe to this channel. And please put the bell notification on because we post every single week and you don't wanna miss it. So with that being said, I'll see you next week. Bye.